Hello, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Campus Debates. My name is Masi Vugutsa and as always I get the honor, the privilege and the ability to host Campus Debates Season 2. The most interesting thing about Campus Debates is that it's a show where young people get to engage with you intellectually and to also allow you to understand a few things that are happening around you. Could be something affecting you, your family, your friends, or anyone that you know. And the best thing about it is that it is from the perspective of young people, giving a platform for young people to give them a voice and an ability to contribute to what happens within society. That's beautiful, right? Now, I know you're wondering, what does this second half look like? If this is your first time joining us, we are running a show where teams or different universities get to debate against each other. Every team that wins gets three points, and the team that loses gets one point. But that was as per the first preliminary rounds. For these rounds that follow, every team that wins gets three points, and a team that loses gets zero points. At the end of these preliminary rounds, we'll get to eliminate two universities for not being able to meet the th threshold. Let us know on the comment section which university you'd like to see for quarterfinals and which university you think might not make it to quarterfinals. Allow me to welcome the debaters for this round. From side proposition, we have University of Nairobi, and from side opposition, we have United States International University. <laughs> I know you're ready to hear from them, but before you do, I think a fun fact about the two teams that are before us this evening is that they are active debaters. Some of them have won tournaments and actively being able to be one of the best debaters that we have in Kenya. So I know for sure that this round will be amazing, exhilarating, and even fiery for the debaters before us are very extravagant in their debating experience and expertise. With that, welcome proposition to introduce themselves and tell us something interesting that they are yet to tell us as for the first debates. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jane Baraza from the University of Nairobi. I am a debater, a judge sometimes, and I just love the entire spirit of debating itself. Hi guys, my name is Paul Kitui from Your In Law. I'm happy to be here today. Something interesting about me, I love to sleep. So for the team in black, representing University of Nairobi, they are speakers who love debating and at the same time love sleeping. I don't know what that says about their debating capacities, but we are yet to find out. From side opposition, I will allow them to introduce themselves. Okay. Hi, my name is Angel. I, yeah, I'm from USIU and something interesting about me is that I play the flute. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi guys, my name is Joshua, also from USIU. Uh, an interesting thing about me is I know how to play the drums. Okay, then from side opposition we have musicians who love to play the flute and the drums. I think it's an exhilarating round where debaters from both sides, proposition and opposition, are ready to engage you in their intellectual capacities. Without further ado, I would love to welcome our judges to introduce themselves. Hello everyone. My name is Wycliffe Fortiano. I'll be a judge for today. Uh, it's going to be an interesting round to see the University of Nairobi, which claim to be the best university in Africa, and USIU Africa, which claim to be an uni international university in Africa. Between them, who wins? It's going to be an interesting round. I'd love to see that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Perez Ngono, and I'm going to be the chair for this round. All the best. Hello everyone, my name is Eva Wanjiru Mwangi, one of the judges, and something interesting about me, I love abstract art. The beauty lies in the mystery. As she has said, the beauty lies in the mystery. And for this round, the mystery is, which university is international capacity? Do you think the University of Nairobi should reclaim its title of being the most excellent university in East and South and Limpopo? Or do you think United States International University is actually living up to its international standard of being the best university? Without further ado, the motion for this round reads, this house prefers a world where debts incurred by a president leaving office 
is billed to the president as opposed to the national kitty. For example, unpaid euro bonds, unpaid IMF loans, ETC. I will read that again. This house prefers a world where debt incurred by a president leaving office is billed to the president as opposed to the national kitty. As an audience, I know you're ready to understand whether you need your presidents to actively be liable for the debts that they leave behind, or do you think that you should carry forward their debts and pay them on their behalf? Now, to welcome the first speaker proposition to start off their argument. Here, here. Nobody is above the law, not even the king himself, because it is that very law that makes him king. Uh, these are a quote I learned in my first year of law. I can't remember the specific legal scholar who wrote it. But the implication of this is one person cannot do something bad and then like the rest of the nation pays, especially through taxes and in the way like they service that debt and that kind of thing. I'm going to do a few things in my framing. Firstly, and the first layer of framing is simple. As a president and as a leader, you've taken an oath to God and to country. You've sworn that you'll put the country's best interests at heart. The second thing I'd like to talk about in framing is the fact that you had the ability to make informed decisions. Each president is loaded with resources, with intelligence, and the best analysts and these kinds of things. So like the likelihood of failure is like very low, considering everything that they have at their disposal. The third thing I would like to talk about is time. They had time to do their mandate. At worst, they had one term, which is approximately four, five, six years, depending on the country. Now, the last thing I would like to talk about in terms of setup is quite simple, on the practicality of it and how this thing will particularly look like. We think that whatever you will take away from a president includes all of the luxuries. So whatever is required for them to self-sustain, basically food, water, shelter, security should be maintained. The only thing we propose that is taken is if they have large tracts of land or like a convoy of cars and that kind of thing. We think that this is something they can forfeit if they put the country at like a very bad place. So that will look like that. I think it will also probably look like the recent controversies with the presidency compensation scheme, like Uhuru Kenyatta's office, right? So like the idea is, a president who's entitled to 46 convoys of cars probably does not need them. They also don't need to change their cars each and every single year or two or three or that kind of thing. We think like a car that's been there for 10 years and well maintained is perfectly reasonable to use. So this is how this thing will particularly look like, right? So I'm going to do three things. One, I'm going to show you why this is justified. Secondly, I'm going to talk about why it will bring solvency. And thirdly, I'm going to talk about why the alternative of maintaining status quo cannot and will not work. So the first idea of justification, I'm going to talk about a few principles. One is proportionality and why these would be completely proportional. We think people trusted you with so much power, intelligence, money, and security, and people gave you time like we've talked about in our framing. So you have no business leaving a country with debt at the very least. We think to a great extent, some external factors can contribute to this, but to a certain extent, there was enough resources at your disposal for you to be able to do this properly. So it is quite proportional because you afforded all of that power. You should also be able to like pay the price, especially to extents where like the debt was unreasonable and that kind of thing. The second thing is legitimacy and why is this legitimate? I think you, we essentially to prove this, we need to show that a lot of the actors here, in this case, these citizens have the authority to make the choice. Something simple, social contract and the whole concept, right? A lot of people have ceded a lot of the autonomy and taxes to give you one person to influence the life of millions. We then think it is legitimate that they enforce such a thing and like uh, enforce whatever it is. That means like taking like resources from the president. And the next thing is just accountability and why it's justified under justification why it's uh, accountability is there. We think you've, we've already proven that they've done something wrong. So then to prove this accountability, you need to hold them accountable because like they've misused resources, they've taken a debt without like regard to the other people. We think to that extent, we think you can hold them accountable to this and these are all the reasons why it is justified. Now let's talk about solvency and like the solvency mechanism of these and how it will work. It's very simple. We'll make a very, very technical concession here and we'll be charitable. We agree that you are forfeiting collecting money from a large pool of people from to one person. You're taking money from one person. Now, admittedly, that won't be as much, but we think it's still likely to be a significant amount, especially in cases like African presidents. Someone is rich and like the citizens and the subjects are all like poor and that kind of thing. One person is likely to cater for thousands, in some extreme cases, even hundreds of thousands of what like other people will have given in tax in another capacity, right? But even beyond this, we think the principal message that it sends is much more important. The idea that you're holding the leader 
the very top accountable. Now, why is that important? If a leader at the top is accountable, everything changes. It starts with a leader and it trickles down. Look at Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Look at Paul Kagame. These are individual people that have taken the initiative to better their countries from the top down. We think holding that, them accountable to that degree will ensure solvency. And in the long term, nobody wants to see their finances and resources taken away. Nobody wants to see them and their families and these kinds of people hurt and that kind of thing. We think when you threaten them to this degree, that they'll only be left with the bare minimum or something like that, which is very likely because like one person can service the whole country. It's very, very likely that they'll comply to a greater degree. Now, why can the alternative not work? And it's very, very simple. It's because one, when you're in power, power corrupts, it blinds. It like shields you from like the reality, right? That's just the thing. Secondly, and most importantly, this is the thing. Politics has become incentivized by money. How you get into politics is simple. I'm going to acquire money. I'm going to win elections. I'm going to get back the money that I won from the people. And then I'm going to make myself rich from that point, right? Because politics is driven by money and the incentive to get rich, we think attacking this incentive severely like changes status quo. You deciding to to stick with status quo essentially does not change anything because you are informing whichever has informed the bad politics that we've had in status quo, like up to this very point. We then think the delta that we achieve in this debate is particularly at that point because we are able to achieve impacts to a greater degree. What are the impacts of this? We think it's very, very simple. One, we think we can claim like fewer unnecessary loans. A country doesn't need to be labeled as loan dependent, more trust in the country and like they can invest and that kind of thing. Secondly, you have a better economy, better jobs, better food, healthcare, and like you have a reformed political scene. With that, we rest our case. Thank you. Proposition has laid out their argument. They say that it is justified for you to actively hold presidents accountable for every single amount of debt that has been calculated and collected during their term of office. We welcome side opposition to engage with side proposition's argument and to start off their case. Here, here. Okay. Um, so to start off, I feel like uh, something that has been, something that stands, for, that has to exist for their case to stand, is that first of all, these leaders, that the debt is intentional, right? Like they want to leave the country in a state of debt. Of debt. And um, they also say that in their side, they have fewer unnecessary loans, but they don't necessarily tell us the effect of this on necessary loans, right? So I'm going to start with a bit of characterization. First of all, why are loans important? And why do countries take, why do countries take and need loans, right? So first of all, that fast access to capital allows for development, right? Because the alternative is for you as a country to raise that money and you can't really take part in any big projects until you have all the money to pay the contractors, to buy the materials, etc. And the state at that point does not necessarily have that capital, and so the returns from that can go back to paying back that money, right? Additionally, that accumulation would not necessarily be feasible in a world where you have political turnover, because, right, like you could be raising money for this road, and then the next party just decides they don't want to do that, and just like that, it's gone, right? Additionally, there are crisis situations that exist, right? You could have a situation that destabilizes the economy. You could have unrest. You could have floods. You could have famine, et cetera. And then they disrupt the economy, right? So to bring the country back to a state of balance, Country, countries usually take loans to be able to deal with these emergency situations, right? They can come and say aid organizations exist, etc. However, first of all, aid is not guaranteed, and it's not guaranteed that it will be to the extent that it is required. Additionally, aid can also be like need-based, right? So if you could require food, they'd give you food, something like that, right? Additionally, the country needs to take further measures, right? They need to take measures in the best interest of the economy. So if a country is going through um, deflation, right, or like basically the economy is unstable and they want to do something about it, and they want to do something like fiscal stimulus, right? They want to like throw money into the economy so that they can raise it again, low interest loans, get people to buy more bonds, etc. If they want to do this, they cannot do this because they do not have the capital and we believe that these loans are important because they allow them to do this. Why is this important? First of all, um, they cannot come and say that they can just take small reasonable loans because sometimes the urgency of the situation doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily allow for that to happen, right? So we think that government income is generated by, we think first of all, that debts are already an unpopular in status quo, right? We think that countries do not want debt, right? Why is this? First of all, the more debt you have, countries are, are Countries are given credit ratings based on whether or not they are able to repay their loans. So we believe that they want to repay their loans because the more you don't do that, the lower your rating goes, the less likely people are to buy bonds from you, right? And so we think that 
I'll take it in my fifth minute. And so we think that this is problematic because we think that the state would want to have a good score so that people can buy bonds from them, so that they can get this because bonds are a very big part of government income, right? When you have less people buying bonds, now you have to generate income from elsewhere, i.e. increasing taxes or like measures like that, right? So note that states are not just taking loans just to accumulate debt. They do intend to pay it back. And so we, we believe that in, if in status quo, they have been unable to do this, that in that world, they wouldn't magically come up with creative situations where they would, with creative ways to be able to do this, right? That's the end of my characterization. Now, what exactly would a world where the president is held liable for the debt that has not been paid look like, right? So first of all, we believe that this would look like a lot of defaulting, right? Because at the point at which you're not able to pay back this loan, you would, you, no one just has four trillion shillings sitting in their account ready to pay back. So it's very unlikely that they'll, they'll be able to do this and so they'll default, right? They'll stop paying. And what happens at the point at which the president defaults, right? First of all, the, um, the creditors would then have to intervene, which would look like economic restructuring. It, would, it could look like liquidization of assets, changing of monetary policies, ETC, holding off infrastructural pro projects, things like that. And we think that this is not, first of all, this is not good for the country. Second of all, this is not good for the sovereignty of the country because now they do not necessarily have that much um, power over their own monetary policy. And we think that this adversely also affects international trade because it affects your currency. Your currency goes down, becomes a problem, right? So we believe that that's a worse world. And, um, huh. okay, so let's go into why does limited liability as a concept even exist, right? Let's look at it, for example, in a corporate, in a corporate position, right? The reason that owners and the, and the companies are seen as two different entities is so that decisions that are made are made on are made with the company in mind and not with the owner's interest in mind. Extending this to a country, we think that there is utility in having that separation between the, between the president's personal interests and the, economic, and the political decisions made by them, right? So for example, we think, that, we think that at the point at which the president is the one held liable, they are more likely to make decisions that affect their own personal interests. For example, if, I, if I'm on my fourth, I'm on the fourth year of my term, right? And then there's a disaster happening and there's, like, there's essentially a crisis and I need to do something about that. I, as the president, will not want to take up that loan because I know that it's unlikely I'm going to pay it at the time at which I'm living, at, at which I'm living power. And so I, I essentially will not be thinking in the best capacity of the state. I'd be thinking in the best capacity of myself because you've, you've intertwined these interests so deeply, right? Additionally, when you have like reasonable infrastructural developments, right? Like you want to make an investment that you know is going to pay back with time, even if you could be just because you know it's not going to pay back by the time that you're done, then you're simply just not going to make it, which again is not in the best interest of the state. And so we pre think we prefer a world whereby our president acts in the best interest of the state and whereby the state is held liable for this, um, for the loans. Uh, my partner will take the few words. Loans, debts, economics, and the capacity of presidents to pay back loans. That has been the sum of proposition and opposition's argument. From proposition, they say that they think the president needs to be held liable for the decisions that they make. From opposition, they argue that the president will now forfeit their responsibility while they are in office in fear of the accumulation of debts that might amount to while they are in office. I think they're very valid arguments from both teams. I don't know if any team has been able to sway you so far, but feel free to comment on X at KTN Home with the hashtag Campus Debates. We'll be going on a short commercial break, and when we are back, we'll continue with the debaters' arguments and perspectives as to whether they think the president should be held liable for for the debts that have accumulated during their terms of office. Here, here. Welcome back from the short commercial break and thank you for choosing to hang on with us and choosing to tune in to Campus Debate Season 2. If you're just joining us for this episode, we have University of Nairobi meeting United States International University, both amazing speakers and amazing teams. So far, Proposition argues that the whole idea of principle of proportionality, legitimacy, and accountability is maximized in their world where the president is held liable for the debts that are accumulated. 
Opposition argues that at a point in time where presidents are held liable for this, then they'll forfeit their responsibilities and their abilities to actually work on the world, all the things that happen within states and all of that. They also argue that the accumulation of debts and loans is not something that they want, but rather a situation that they find themselves in. If you're not a fan of economics, I promise you the debaters that are before us will engage you further and help you understand a little bit about how loans and debts are accumulated. With that, we welcome the second speaker proposition to continue their case. Here, here. Chair, recognize the world that opposition is trying to argue is most definitely status quo. If they're going to argue about the entire idea of the best interest of the state, they need to show us how even currently the way citizens are the ones who are actually paying high taxes due to the um, mismanagement of funds that have already like, been incurred by the state itself. They need to show us specifically how the best interest of the state is going to be achieved. At a point where we're able to show you that the state itself is not acting towards the best interest of these individuals and it's still the citizens themselves who are left to pay for these things, we find it to actually be quite detrimental and we'd rather have a situation where the president is actually taking up the responsibility of paying up for these things in itself, right? A little bit of rebuttal to whatever they talk to us about. I feel like they try to call us out on the entire idea of taking unnecessary loans and they were not able to like get the scope of our case. Here's the entire idea of the, like, the necessity of the loans. Most definitely the state takes these loans so that they're able to cater for the citizens, right? But it gets to a point where the state itself tends to actually mismanage these funds in that the people who are meant to actually be catered for by this like these funds themselves, they don't get to enjoy it to the best potential. And even if they get to enjoy them, we find it's actually happening, to, like let me say, towards a shorter term. Meaning we, get, we are having a situation where the state and even like the president themselves, who, who, the president himself, who is actually actively participating and drafting down how these loans are supposed to be taken down, he does not actually even calculate how far the, these loans are supposed to cater for these individuals, even for the long term. What does this actually look like? We're having a situation where a lot of loans are being taken, but we're still having a situation where most politicians are actually thriving and starting out businesses. Why? This is why now the unnecessity uh, and the unnecessity of the loans is actually coming about. They tend to take po like portions of these loans that they actually take for these individuals and they tend to invest in the businesses that they actually have out here. And they cannot fear that that does not happen because it is actually evident. And that is why Paul is trying to talk to you about the entire idea as to how we should penalize these individuals. In that, they cannot. we are not trying to tell them that you should not take up like the entire four trillion loan that exists in Kenya. No. Rather, we are talking about the seizure of like the uh, like unnecessary or like let me say the automatic luxuries that these individuals tend to actually exist and you actually find it to be quite legitimate specifically from the principle that Paul was talking to you about because when this presidents are actually in power, they tend to enjoy these benefits in itself. These are people who are having a lot of, like they have a, a very big salary, they tend to enjoy all these trips in itself. We do not even understand why specifically they can come and talk to us about the entire idea as if you are trying to punish the president. We are not punishing the president, rather we are trying to hold him accountable. The same principle that Paul was talking to us about. And I feel like this itself is even going to have some virtue signaling when it comes to like future entrance in politics. Because at a point where a president tends to understand that if at all I get into, like, into, into my position and the loans that I tend to take for this individuals it's actually going to come back to me i feel like it's actually going to happen on a couple of fronts in that the moment these presidents are able to like take on this sort of responsibility that we're not going to have a continuous system where we are going to suffer within a cycle where presidents are constantly taking loans and you know they, they actually thrive under the entire like fun um life no sorry they thrive under the fun um, nature of politics, the way Paul was able to talk to you about. The entire idea as to how politics is actually mostly, like, let me say, um, a money party. They tend to get in, they enjoy all these benefits in itself. We feel like at a point where they get to understand that they'll actually be held accountable for these specific sort of loans. It will even like enable them to actually strategize better when it comes to these specific sort of things. At a point where they even want to like keep the luxuries that they want to ex they want to enjoy, we find it's even much better that they are able to like understand how to manage these funds in itself. This even now talks about the entire idea. Of like now the unnecessary loans that Paul is able to talk to you about because then they understand that once their ten like the five time or like their ton ten term period is already done with and they are going to be penalized for this. I feel like it would even much it would actually be much better for them to understand that they're within a risk of losing a lot if they're not able to like manage these things better. At a point where they're able to do this, we're not even able to like improve the economy. The impact that he's able to talk to us about because at a point where we're constantly taking a large pool of loans and it is we the citizens who are constantly having our taxes increased. They're taxing even the small things like our basic needs and we're still even suffering within this specific sort of system. We do not even understand where solvency is actually going to come within their position. But before I proceed, your POI. <coughs> okay. The president can still take out a $50 million loan then increase taxes within his term to pay it off. How is there a difference in your world? Okay. In regards to, we can just steal that money anyways while he's still in office. 
Exactly. Now that is why we even try to like keep them accountable because at a point where you take on these big loans and you tend to tax people for them, we feel like the moment you're able to understand like the long-term impact that are actually going to come with it is actually going to be quite important. The moment you understand that if I take a big loan and I'm still going to tax people, it's going to follow me afterwards. Meaning you'll even have an incentive to not want to take on these loans as big as you're actually claiming that they're actually going to be taken. We do not understand the reason as to why this president should constantly be allowed to work within a system where citizens are the ones who are constantly paying for like the, they're constantly paying for the mismanagement of the pool of funds that these politicians themselves actually tend to understand. What is the delta within our case? Loans will still be taken, but what are we actually incentivizing? We want a system where these loans are actually taken and they're well, well like they're properly managed, and these po politicians themselves who actually tend to thrive under the backbone and even under the work hard of the citizens themselves who even tend to pay for this by their taxes. We want them to feel the pinch of understanding that the moment you tend to thrive under all these benefits and you're still going to enjoy all the benefits at the end of your term, we still want to we want you to understand that it is still the citizens who are still going to be, like pay for all these things in itself. We, d we want, it's time that we stop the system where it is actually the, the sons who are actually paying for the sins of the father and the other now have this president taking accountability for the mismanagement that they have. They do not have any solvency. We attain more. Proud to rest from prop. Proposition tells you that they do not think that sons need to pay off the sins of their fathers, but fathers should pay off the sins by themselves. I don't know what opposition has to say about that statement, but we welcome the second speaker, opposition, to engage and finish off their case as opposition. Here, here. I think the one thing that I can ex explain to you guys is if you could have development without loans, we would be doing that anyways, right? There's a reason why every single country in the world has loans that outgrow its GDP year after year after year. All the countries within the G7 have above more than like $50 trillion within loans to each other, right? Loans are fundamental to development. At the point in which you do not have loans, you cannot develop. I think my partner has talked to you how that's likely to happen. I'll go into a bit into that later. So engagement on responsibility, which is the whole case. I'll show you how that doesn't necessarily work in our world. Number one, mechanisms such as defaulting on loans will continue to exist in GovWorld, so the president can then just take out as many loans as they want, then default on those loans at the point in which before they leave office. At the point in which you default on the loans, it means at the point in which you leave office, that responsibility is no longer on you, right? That's still a way that the presidents can necessarily then use to now not be responsible within their world and still not be held accountable. They have to explain that. Secondly, this fundamentally makes uh, timid leaders who will be unwilling to engage in landmark projects, for example, like Tika Superhighway, because of the chance that they cannot pay it back within the time that they were in office. I think the third response is that loans are already unpopular within status quo. I think there's a disincentive to take out more and more loans. We think that a metric in regards to how opposition parties tend to use loans and people taking out more and more loans as a way to attack the party in power to get more votes. I think, for example, in Kenya, the Kenyan public isn't necessarily against loans anyways. I think that's a disincentive to actually take more and more loans anyway. So I think responsibility in regards to loan taking out is something that exists in both worlds. But I think there's still mechanisms that exist to allow irresponsible presidents to not pay the bill at the end of the day, right? So let me just give you an important context in regards to these loans. But before I get into that, let me just engage with what they told you, right? They'll have a pretty ridiculous gaze when they tell us that, oh, they think it's unfair for a president to take out loans that then we have to pay for. But understand, that's going to happen in both worlds anyways when you take out loans. And still, I can still be corrupt in their world because, as I said, I can still take out a $50 million, a $50 million uh, loan, eat that money within my uh, 10 years within the office, then increase taxes so that they pay it off before I leave office. I can still be more corrupt within their world. They haven't shown how that necessarily doesn't stop, right? First thing is the loan repayment period within status quo, our world, is calculated based on the capacity of the national economy, right? Large infrastructure projects such as the Thika Superhighway will take decades to pay off because because we give China a couple of million um, shillings every year because the, uh, the plan is supposed to, for it to be repaid over the span of decades, right? In opposition world, the timeline is shrunk down to five to 10 years within the Kenyan context. The impact is that this increases the taxation because you have to increase taxes in order to pay off this loan within a very, very short period of time. 
ordinary people suffer, the prices of goods goes up, we have less disposable income, you have less spending, businesses have to either downsize or shut down. This leads to a general decrease in economic activity and GDP. The impact of that is that it actively decreases the capacity of the nation to even pay off those loans in the first place because of the decrease in economic productivity, right? This is all to the, due to the ridiculous and unrealistic requirement of paying back billions in only about five to 10 years, right? Understand that's not something that necessarily you can see is feasible. Second thing is more of the national budget will be committed to this debt repayment in their world. In our world, as, as, at least we spread out the repayments over decades so that the government can now take more than 10 years to pay these things off, right? Within those 10 years in their world, more, of the, more than half of the budget will be dedicated to repayment, which means that there's decrease in spending on health, infrastructure, and other government projects that help everyday people. That's what you don't get on their side, right? Our country cannot survive without loans. You need it primarily for two things that my partner said, but let me go into that a bit more, right? The first thing is crisis management, for example, floods or COVID, where the government needs money to stimulate the economy, right? The problem is that in GovWorld, presidents are actively disincentivized from taking out emergency relief loans because there is no way for the economy to recover fast enough for this loan to be paid off within their term, right? So they know that they will have to now personally pay at the point in which, let's say, I'm in my fifth year of presidency. There was a flood or there's a drought or there's something happening within a desolate region, right? I'm not going to take out emergency loans because I cannot pay that back within the span of a year. I know that I'm necessarily not, that's not, I'm, I can't necessarily pay that at the point in which I'm outside of office. What then happens is, I'm just going to say, you know what, let them suffer for now. The next president will not foot that bill when they come into office. We think that that perpetuates suffering. It is principally unjustified on their world at the point in which, as my partner says, it, it incentivizes presidents to now focus on their own personal assets more than the suffering of these individuals, right? So let me just go into that. Gov has to show what incentive there is for a president to take out a 30 billion shilling loan to alleviate starvation, especially in the last year, right? Second thing, reason as to why people, uh, countries take out loans is infrastructure development. But the problem is, in Gov world, you have to raise money through taxation over many years because leaders do not want to take the time, et cetera, et cetera, right? So at the point in which my partner told you, let's say you want to build a road, but you have to have the money ahead of time, right? You have to have the money all in, in full in order to build that road because you cannot take loans like they said. So me, I start raising money in my administration. The next administration comes and says, we don't necessarily want that road. Let me just take that money and then use it as a slush fund to now pay off more debts or maybe uh, build, uh, I don't know, a, a mall somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. There's no continuity in regards to projects. The reason why the people necessarily suffer is if we need super, I think a super highway to deliver people, to deliver goods for economic productivity, we do not get that in their world at the point in which you cannot necessarily have these mega projects that span multiple administrations. You do not get that continuity, do not get long-term development in their world. That's something that they have to respond to. Um, I think with that, I rest my case. Thank you. Again, money has always been a sore subject for any human being that exists in this world. And for the debaters that are before us, money has clearly become a sore subject for them. They cannot seem to agree whether the president needs to pay off the debts they've collected or that people have the active responsibility to pay off these debts, provided they were used for the development of the country as a whole structure and all of that, right? Now, a question to all the critics, skeptics, and anyone who's possibly watching us this evening. Do you think that you're comfortable paying off a debt that a president has accumulated, whether they've managed it well or not? Do you think it's justified for you to pay it off for them? Or do you think that the presidents who already have capacity need to pay off these loans by themselves because they are the sole perpetrators of the borrowing of these loans? Let us know on X at KTN Home with the hashtag Campus Debates. And we'll be back after a short break to further engage with you as per whether the judges were convinced by proposition or opposition. And furthermore, to analyze whether the arguments from each team were sufficient enough to give them three points or whether they were insufficient to make them win this round. See you after a short break. Welcome, welcome back to the third half of Campus Debates, this particular episode, where we have University of Nairobi debating against the United States International University. Funny thing, both universities 
claim the international status and the status of being the best universities that are there to offer. With that, they have argued, they have debated, and the summary of what has happened is that proposition argues that there is need for them to, uh, there is need for opposition to prove as to why the current status quo necessarily caters to citizens as a whole, where presidents take out massive loans and leave debts for citizens to pay. At the same time, the argument is that when these loans are taken out, they're mismanaged by the presidents and the people that are in office, which doesn't justify why citizens need to pay them off. But from side opposition, they argue that there's necessity for these debts to be taken out. It means that development cannot exist for states that are not able to raise enough money to actively maintain their capacity and develop as a whole, which is why there's necessity for debts existing. I don't know which argument has swayed you or which one has not, but because I'm yet to be swayed and the judges agree with me, they have decided to ask a question to proposition and opposition, so I will hand over the floor to judges to ask their questions. Okay, my question goes to team proposition, and the question is, you've been arguing about accountability. So how sure are we, how sure are we guaranteed that there will be accountability? Do, we, do you have an impact analysis on their accountability? Okay, my question goes to side opposition. So you argue that loans are very important, whether they're managed well or not. So how do you mitigate the harms or hold leaders accountable or stop this deterrence of this behavior of mismanaged or misappropriated loans for selfish or individual growth? From the questions that the judges have asked, I think the biggest clash for this debate is on accountability. Which side then is able to prove to the judges that our accountability metrics can exist on either side and I think the team that best does this is able to win. But without shooting myself in the foot, I welcome proposition with one minute to respond to that question. Here, here. On the response of accountability, we are asking us, we are seeking for a situation where the presidents are in a best position to properly manage the funds. At a point where they are able to like properly allocate these funds and they are going to like, go, they are going to be used within like the best use to be able to like suit the citizens, it's going to be like within the best position. We do not want a situation where these presidents are constantly taking on loans and they're properly, go, like they're most, in most case scenarios, going to invest in their own private businesses and at a point where they were not able to like give back to us the most imp important benefit for citizens, we do not want that sort of situation they call us out on the entire idea as to why we are how we are going to combat these presidents as from being able to like increase taxes within their regimes a couple of responses to this a at a point where these taxes are increased within this specific sort of period we are having a situation where this it means that these sort of funds have already been like put to a very have been put to like a better use and at a point where we're able to like better increase the economy we're having a situation where we're able to like solve our debt system and we're even not going to like prolong it to the period where they're trying to talk to us about where we're trying to like prolong the entire concept of like debt payment towards a decade we feel like us being able to like sort these issues within a short specific po like a specified period of time is actually going to be much beneficial. We're able to still get loans. All we want is for the presidents to be able to properly utilize them and they're able to like enjoy all the benefits and they're still able to like retain their luxuries. Proper submission from proposition. Okay, uh, the question was how do we mitigate against the misuse of these funds, right? So how do you manage or promote accountability? I think the one interesting thing is they weren't able to prove accountability anyways on their side because now we have things like you can still get out loans and steal money and raise taxes so that that then could be paid out at the point in which you're still within office. You can still be as corrupt as you want on this end. I think we have a better response for you as to why there's still better mitigatory um, solutions that exist within status quo that actually promote accountability. I think number one is the media, which holds leaders accountable. At the point in which Ruto goes out there and gets another 50 billion shilling loan, that's going to be all around the news, right? That's necessarily something that's going to care about because now people necessarily watch, you know, shows like, you know, KTN or whatever and the news and the like, so to actually get information as to what their leaders are doing, right? At the point in which now they're put on blast in that capacity, 
at, that means that then it, at the point in which they want to run for office again, they have to make sure that they're in the best you know, view of the citizens. I think secondly, you have the voters who have the power to vote out corrupt leaders at the point in which during the whole campaign, they took out loans and these people do not necessarily see any material benefits or material changes within their lives. I think then the voters can go out there and vote out those people. I think thirdly is opposition parties who still exist within status quo that then often now regulate and mitigate against misuse of funds from the leading party. At the point in which the leading party is misusing funds, the opposition party wants to now gain support will now hound on that. Like, yeah, this person is misusing funds, kick them out of office, do not vote for them, right? So we see a lot of more competent mechanisms that exist within status quo that mitigate against misuse of funds. They don't have any accountability on that, their side anyways, and they have no um, infrastructure projects, they have no progress on their side. I think on that, we're able to win on that clash. Thank you. I think the one thing that is common about the debaters that we have in this um, audience or in this debate currently is that both all speakers actively like to use the word in and of itself and intuition pumps and things like that when they're making their submissions and arguments. I think it's very important for us to understand what has gone on in the entirety of the debate before we allow the judges to give us their verdict. The arguments of the biggest clashes in this round were accountability of this president mismanagement or the management of funds and which side guarantees the proper management of these particular funds, necessity of debt existing within societies and societal structures, and finally, the possibility of default in payment. Which side do you think best caters to the clashes that have existed within this debate? Because I think if we can respond to all of these questions, then we better cater to the whole idea of how debts are accumulated and how we can offer solvency to the repayment of these debts. Without further ado, I welcome the judges to give us the verdict for this round, which team has won and which team has lost. So, on a unanimous decision, it is team opposition over proposition. Why is this the case? So, blending down to, before I go to the clashes, so the clashes, accountability, one, second, whatever is prioritized. But let me just go to whatever is prioritized. So should we prioritize on a principled level accountability vis-a-vis -vis the kind of pragmatic where we get on the economic impact? So we needed more of um, analysis from proposition to show the economic impact, which OP has already explained that these are the consequentialist um, arguments that we are going to get if we probably tell the president that you're the one who's going to um, cater for these loans once you're out of office, and um, this is how the economy is going to suffer in the long run. So we needed more responses as to how um, this is going to be mitigated on their side, or how their world best mitigates that. Now, secondly, on this clash of accountability one, um, I really don't appreciate the unfair burden that opposition pushed pushed on proposition on um, raising t that you can literally raise taxes and like still partake in corruption and all these things are going to just be foregone. But one thing I really appreciated in like this accountability clash is that you can literally default before your term is over. That and um, that limited kind of liability whereby if you intertwine the personalities, politics and my personal interests, that is incentive enough for me to probably opt out of this presidency thing and economic bandwagon altogether. Thank you. The judges are very intellectual because according to them, based off of the clashes that existed within the debate, the United States International University have been able to win this round. And with that, they've earned for themselves three amazing points. And because as per the last preliminary rounds, they had four points in total, plus this round, they get to have seven points in totality. And with that, we get the privilege and the ability to possibly see them in the outruns, which are the quarterfinals and possibly semis and probably finals. But we'll get to see how that goes as per their following rounds. But with that, we appreciate United States International University for winning this round.
On the other hand, however, University of Nairobi has been unable to win this round. But because they won their previous rounds or their previous preliminary rounds, they now stand at six points in total rather than having zero points. And I think it's amazing that there's a possibility we might see them in the outruns or we might not. But do not worry, we will get another chance to hear, see the amazing speakers from University of Nairobi. Now, because you've come to the end of this debate round, I think I need to clarify what clashes look like. We've been throwing around this word and I don't know if you understand as an audience. Clashes are the biggest arguments that come out from both opposition and proposition, which places a burden on both teams to understand or explain further on that particular argument so that they can win the debate. And with that, we have come to the end of this episode of Campus Debate Season 2. Thank you so much for choosing to tune in with us on Monday at 8 p.m. for this whole hour and hopefully We'll get to see you next week on Monday, same time, same place. You can tell your friends, tell your family members, and anyone else who you think can be interested in this show where young people get to engage with everything that happens within society. Final note is that, do you think that you ought to pay for the president's mismanagement of funds by the accumulation of debts, or do you think the president needs to be held liable for the accumulation of these debts? See you next week, same time, same place, with me, Massivo Gutsa.